Everyone, welcome back. We're continuing our discussion of learning and memory, this time zooming in and talking about heavy plasticity. Heavy plasticity is sort of the process by which um, neuron connectivity can change to reflect learning, pioneered by Donald Hebb, the man himself. So we talked a lot about the different types of learning that can take place. Now we're going to zoom in and talk about mechanistically how that happens. So Hebb's rule is um, the cellular basis of learning, the idea that cells that fire together wire together. Throughout this video, we're going to use the example of eye-blink classical conditioning, which is a really, really well-established paradigm, which animals learn that a 1000 hertz tone will predict the occurrence of a puff of air to the eye, an unpleasant but not harmful stimulus, right? And the whole idea here is that before any learning takes place, auditory neuron, right? This purple neuron here represents auditory information, so the sound information coming in. This auditory neuron has a weak synapse with the motor neuron that governs the blink response, right? And that makes sense. We don't blink every time we hear a sound. However, the somatosensory system neuron, the one that detects the presence of an air puff around our eye, does have a strong synapse with the blink-producing motor neuron. And this also makes sense, right? If something touches your eye, you shut your eye, right? It makes sense. That's a strong synapse. If something touches your eye, you shut your eye. Great. So you hear a sound in your environment, you don't shut your eye that makes sense. But with enough trials, you learn that the tone predicts something touching your eye. So you learn to shut your eye in response to that tone happening. And this isn't really a cognitive thing, right? When you hear a tone, you don't think about it and say, oh, tone means puff. I'm going to shut my eye now. You almost reflexively, very quickly close your eye. And that's what we need to have happen here, right? We need this synapse to be strengthened. We need this tone to drive this auditory system neuron in such a way that it will cause this neuron to blink. So uh, what we're going to talk about through this unit and the next one is the process of long-term potentiation, the changes that take place here that allow that learning to sort of stay around for a while. So this is a classical conditioning process, right? Because it's a predictive relationship. The air puff will activate a somatosensory cell, which will activate the motor neuron and produce a blink. That's a strong synapse. Same time, before any kind of conditioning, uh, the tone uh, will activate this auditory neuron system cell, but it will not activate the motor neuron, right? It's, it's a weak synapse, so no blink takes place. However, if synapse T fires when the motor cell fires, so if these two are firing around the same time, synapse T will become strong. Okay, let's talk about what we just talked about in a slightly different way with some, some more flashy animations. Okay, so in red, we have our auditory neuron. In green, we have a somatosensory neuron, right? So auditory neuron is carrying information about our the sounds in our environment. And the somatosensory neuron is carrying information about what's physically touching us. So this, let's just say that this green neuron is going to represent um, feeling that puff of air around your eye. The red neuron is going to represent hearing a thousand hertz tone. So let's say uh, we hear a tone and, oh, hang on. Um, let me redo this. Something is up with my animation. Oh, I wasn't even recording. How long have I been off? Okay, let's try looking at this a slightly different way with uh, some flashy animations, okay? So up here we've got our auditory neuron in red, we've got our somatosensory neuron in green. So the auditory neuron is going to represent um, the bringing of that tone information in, that predictive tone CS. And the somatosensory neuron in green is going to represent the uh, air puff somatosensory US right? The aversive event that's going to motivate them. So what happens during conditioning is first an auditory stimulus arrives, which is going to cause our auditory neuron to have an action potential, propagate its way down to the terminal buttons where it's going to release its neurotransmitter stuff, right? And shortly after that, we have an air puff that arrives and boom, action potential makes its way down and it creates um, the polarization here of that motor neuron. The arrival of that somatosensory neuron information is going to be strong enough to create an action potential in this motor neuron. So it's going to have an action potential, which is going to cause the muscles to contract around your eye and allow you to blink, right? So you'll blink in response to that air puff. Totally normal thing to do. So importantly, this auditory neuron wasn't enough on its own, right? That little, the little blast of auditory information is not gonna cause you to blink. It's not gonna depolarize the motor neuron sufficiently. So what happens if we present these two things at the same time, right? Auditory neuron and somatosensory neuron both are going to fire at about the same time, produce their action potential, and depolarize this motor neuron. Of course, 
This is going to cause the motor neuron to be sufficiently polarized and have an action potential all of its own, producing a blink response. That's not super surprising. But with enough trials of this happening together, auditory neuron and somatosensory neuron happening around the same time, such that the auditory neuron, um, that sound information becomes predictive of the occurrence of the air puff, right? We learn that when we hear the, sound, the tone, we're about to get blasted with air, then a change is gonna take place. So now, after we've had a few trials of a tone playing, and then we get, a, we get blasted in the eye with air, we've learned, right? So now when we hear that tone, action potential takes place, that's gonna be now enough to depolarize the motor neuron and produce an action potential, producing a blink response. So that's the learning, right? That didn't happen before. It used to be that we would have to get the puff of air to the eye to blink. Now we don't need the puff of air. Just the CS alone will, will produce the conditioned response, a blink, right? We hear the sound, we close our eyes. That's learning. That's a very, very basic form of learning. So that's kind of classical conditioning in terms of, of a synapse. So in terms of, of behavior and basic learning, that's what we're talking about. Next time, we are going to talk about long-term potentiation. So we're going to zoom way in on this synapse and look at mechanistically what exactly is happening. All right, because it's one thing to say that this connection has been strengthened. Auditory neuron can now produce depolarization in the motor neuron. But how does it do that? How, how, what changes can take place at a synapse to allow that? And that's what long-term potentiation is all about.